Hi there, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm really happy to see you all here. It's good to have you. Um, we have such a great evening tonight, you guys. This is going to be so much fun. Um, I have Patty and I've got Stu here. Uh, both amazing, um, amazing people. And we were just chatting for a little while, getting ready for getting everyone in here. Um, hi. Yes, if you guys, if you guys have your, uh, you want to share your screens, that'd be awesome. Um, if you, hi, yay. <laughs> it's really delightful. Um, but yeah, we have a pretty amazing tasting today and we have, uh, we are so fortunate. You guys, this is Patty. This is Patty Borthwick. Hello, Patty. And Stu Devine. Hello, Stu. Hi, guys. How are you? Some of you may remember Stu from previous webinars, such as, yes, yeah, everyone's like, yes, I do, I remember Stu. Yeah. Uh, and Patty didn't join us last time, but we're super happy to have him here. Patty is the man that you can see in the actual vineyard. We have such a treat today because he is taking us around on his property and we're gonna have multiple, multiple perspectives as we talk about all the wine and, uh, and the wonderful things we're doing. So uh, thank you all for being here. It's gonna be super fun. You know the drill, ask questions. You guys can totally unmute yourselves if you wanna ask a question, put it in the chat box, whatever works for you. Um, for those of you tasting along today, we have a surprise. <laughs> so we do have, um, we're doing of course the 2019 Borthwick Sauvignon Blanc. Um, we are doing the, uh, 20, uh, the, 20, the Pinot Noir, the Borthwick Pinot Noir as well. I actually have the 2019 here, which I was just realizing. Um, but then I also have the, uh, this is a new one. We just, it just came in high time. We had originally wanted to do this. It wasn't available, then it became available. And I think Patty, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're gonna start off with this guy, right? The CPR. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. So yeah. um, I apologize for those of you who don't happen to have this one on hand, but you can get it afterwards. And it's a pretty amazing one. Um, to have. So that's just a brief overview of the wines. Um, I would like to go ahead and just, Patty, I'd like to turn it over to you and please uh, have you say hello and introduce yourself and anything else at the moment. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for coming along. Well, Sasha, for organizing it all. I suppose I just get to uh, stand here and say a few, few things, but just thought we'd go back and start about the vineyard, where it came from, where it started, and a bit of the history. So you can see out here and behind us, this is our, um, the main Sauvignon. I can actually, you can see it sort of it scoots around and then we go around that way. But it's, um, so we're actually based in the lower part of the North Island. So you've got Wellington, the capital of New Zealand, and we're about an hour and a half north of it. Uh, Martinborough is mostly the, the most famous region in the Wairarapa, and then we're north of it about one hour in Gladstone. So Gladstone's, it's not a massive area, but it's got some pretty nice soils, pretty nice climate, and very good for, I guess, the region. they set it up for trying to emulate Burgundy, and that's why they actually grow a lot of Pinot in, huh. in the wider wrapper. So it's all a, a river terrace. We have the Ruamahunga River, which runs around the outside of the, the vineyard, and he's the vineyard's about oh, feet would be about 30 feet above the river. So it's all old riverbed. And then as it's, uh, as the, you know, the silts all come through and filtered in. So it's a, it's a seriously good bit of dirt to actually grow grapes in. And I think what we hey, did- hey, is, hey, Patty, can I, um, can I um, just show them a map of um, the lower North Island so you can, sure. uh, so they can um, see what a, uh, hi guys. Um, yes, Stu's our really... multimedia uh, manager. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Actually, you, Stu. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Make sure so, you put the photo up, Stu. That's right. I've got a naked one of Patty, but that's not yeah. very good. Yeah. So, so Patty, that's his little. So that's some drinking there. Master and yeah, I'll make it bigger, guys, so you see where we are. So, Marlborough. Blenheim, uh, Water Rapper, Hawke's Bay, and then our largest city, Auckland. And where the blue dot is, is where I am. That's so, where the surf's oh, the best. Well, I don't know about that. That's like, Stu, it takes you, uh, is it four hours to drive down to Paddy? Is that right? No, more than that. Oh, okay. uh, four hours to get to uh, Tawonga to Rod. Ah. Uh, it takes another three hours from there. So uh, six and a half hours. Okay. So, Patty, um, do you want to? There's the Ruamahanga. 
Yeah. Um, I'll turn it into uh, one second. So everyone, so you have you have been busy on your computer skills, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> so that's <laughs> that's the vineyard area there. So you can. So that's see what we're that. looking at, Patty, right now behind you. Yeah, Patty's totally. right there. Patty's right there. <laughs> Fantastic. It's got a warning sign. <laughs> now I know how you keep track of me, Stu. You're not even satelliting you. Yeah. Okay. So um, you keep talking, Patrick, and, um, and I'll take so this. See, uh, so this is all, all the wines from the, the Paddy Borthwick all come out of this uh, one single vineyard. Okay. Yeah. And we've got a couple of other vineyards around us, and you can see the river runs around the outside. Yeah. And... and and then the vineyards up on the terrace above it. And then we go back into the one that's got the squares in it with the big cross in it. That's another vineyard and that's another terrace again above and totally different soils. So I think what I like about our vineyard is the depth and the free draining. And we've got this amazing clay content in there. And it's, it's sort of, I think, what adds a bit of substance to the wines, you know, a bit of pallet weight. And I think that's the, the key to it. But you can see there, with that room, that. river comes out of the mountains. So the stones up there in the mountains are this big. And as they sort of wander down the river, they get smaller. So our stones are about this big. Okay. And then as it goes further big down. Big as your head, but smaller than your head. And so as you get down towards Martinborough, it gets to the size of your fingernails. You know, it's all ground up and keeps um, breaking as it goes down. So There's the got, mountains here, guys. That's 5,000 feet up here in the mountains. Got it. Wow. So it's all a, yeah. you know, Wairapa is all a big valley and it's called the Wairapa, it means in Māori, our local indigenous language means glistening waters, because at the end of the Ruamahanga, it forms this big lake, very shallow, and it, when you look at it from a bit of elevation, it actually glistens, so that's why they call it the glistening waters is the Wairapa. That's beautiful. See, that is something I definitely did not know. Um, have you have you always been in Wairapa right here? Or did you, when did you acquire this sort of your vineyard and your land? And when did this yes, all start? I, yep. So I've been born and bred in the Wairapa and then sort of left, went to school down south and then went to Australia, did, uh, you know, the winemaking course over in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I guess the wine, wine industry was pretty young back then. There's no real courses in New Zealand. So it was either Australia or overseas. They went and did flying winemaking for about 12 years, came back down to Marlborough when we call the, the start of the whole Savalanche era in New Zealand of Marlborough, which would have been the, the early 90s. And then uh, went back overseas again. I think I was just avoiding being having responsibilities. <laughs> and enjoying traveling, flying winemaking. It was a fantastic experience to go around the world and, and learn from a lot of other very good winemakers. Yeah. And then uh, dad's sort of, pulled the pin and said, right, I brought some beer dirt. And so we started here in 1996 and uh, we went and got cuttings out of Marlborough, more from vineyards that we had worked with down there that always made good wine. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, it's always been a key for us here is to get good source planting material. And we first planted on its own roots. I guess you know, we had Cabernet, Sauvignon, Merlot, Malbec, Sangiovese. Yeah. And back in the 90s, uh, you know, we could ripen it. You get the sugar, but it wasn't phenologically ripe. Mm. Then Pinot started appearing in New Zealand, and we changed it over to uh, Pinot Noir as the planting materials became available in New Zealand. I think a lot of early Pinot was mainly for bubble base, so they're all Swiss clones, you know, thicker yeah. skins, but not really suited for great table grapes, table wine. And isn't isn't, a, isn't why rapper patty the oldest grown Pinot Noir vineyard sites in New Zealand? It is. It is totally Stu. And interestingly, they when you go back to the 1890s, they had a vineyard planted here with uh, one of the settlers that came over on a boat, and they had a French lady that came over and she brought cuttings, and she put in Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, and Syrah. And there's still oh. bottles that are uh, from those uh, from the 1890s in one of the old homesteads here. And I've tried one of the wines, you know, 110 Illeg years. Illegally, old. too. Illegally. Yeah. Tried. Wait, 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 wait. Illegally. How is it? Well, they, <laughs> Can you explain that briefly? <laughs> well, it's a, it's, it was a very cool story because we had, uh, when they did the, oh, it's Pinot Noir, must have been 20, 
2019 was the last one. And they had a whole lot of media here and they wanted to open these bottles or one of the, you know, two of the bottles for the media to show that, you know, Wairarapa still had original plantings. So there's about four, four cases of the wine still there. Okay. And they haven't, they hadn't opened these bottles for maybe 15 years and they've just been sitting in the cellar in the original homestead. Mm -hmm. And we went up there and we had some media earlier on. And one of the, one of the media guys who's in New Zealand, very well known, and he's sort of niggling at Ed Beatham, who's the custodian of the, those wines and saying, how come we can, you know, how come you don't try them? You must try them. You know, you should be monitoring and managing these wines and, you know, a record. Well, 110 years, it's not like you want to open them every year and check the progress. <laughs> so anyway, everyone else had left and there was Ed Beatham and uh, the wine writer and myself and one other grower. And uh, he, Ed sort of sitting there and uh, the wine writer's going on about this whole, let's open it, let's open it. And Ed's sitting there going, you know, so he comes back and he's got these glasses that are like restaurant glasses. You know, they're sort of not a beautiful you know, tasting glass and he pulls one out and he goes, so what about this? We, and the wine writer goes, that'll be fine. And so he drank this wine and opened it. It was the most amazing experience of trying something that you would think 110 years old in a cork that's just been sitting in a cellar that it would be like vinegar, but it wasn't. It was actually, it's, it was like sherry, but it still had this sweet palate in it. You know, it had sweetness in the mid palate. So for me, it's actually the oldest wine I'll ever try. Maybe, but it was fantastic to see that, you know, 100, 110 year old wine was grown here. And if you think back in days when they made it, there would have been no preservatives. It would have been pretty basic winemaking and those wines are still drinkable. So it was, you know, I look at the area here and think, you know, there's a lot of potential, a lot of future for the wines here as, as they get older. And we're seeing that in the vineyard, you know, as the vines get older, we've had to replant because of phylloxera. Mm -hmm. and, which has been great because, you know, starting with... Uh, you know, hey, hey, well, Patty, Patty, go back to that story. The moral of the story, guys, yeah. is always be the last person to leave a party. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the moral of the story. Yeah, yeah, Patty, yes. Patty Borthwick's never the first to leave. He's always the last to leave. <laughs> You taught me well, Stu. You taught me well. Oh, my goodness. You guys, I mean, I, I can't wait for the day that we can all come down and party with both of you, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we might be a lot older then. We might not party as well. <laughs> Somehow I have a feeling you've got it in you, though. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so behind you, Patty, in the vineyard right now, is that all the Pinot Noir or is that both Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir? And also with the, with the CPR that we were tasting first, obviously it's a unique blend. Um, yeah. Is this all in... From the estate of course right so the, the cpr is that's a, and the cpr is a, a blend of chardonnay pinot gris and riesling which is and crazy. it's under the it's under the paper road label mm -hmm. so we do have the two labels the paddy borthwick's all out of this vineyard mm -hmm. and then we have one other vineyard on the same terrace but a grower and he does a little bit of sauvignon but mainly the paper road cpr does come out of our vineyard and and it's we'll go inside yeah. And uh, we'll have a look at the CPR and get another view. Yes, this is our this is our tour, you guys. I mean, this is yeah. interactive. That's what I'm saying. Pretty exciting, right? <laughs> Yay! A lot of lot of people don't believe we have internet in New Zealand. So, <laughs> so guys, why he's why he's setting up the map of um, the vineyard. So predominantly, you can see the the roads, and they're all running. Um, they're running uh, north south, aren't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. And 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 so. And, and so areas of Pinot, areas of Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, et cetera. So he's broken all these uh, rows into sections. So you can see the different colors. Uh, that's just not from the uh, you know, terrain uh, with the change in it. But you can see there that is most of one of his um, Sauvignon Blanc blocks. Beside okay. it's a Pinot, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, that's so, fascinating. <laughs> yeah, so it's broken up into small parcels. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, another, another funny story was um, originally when Google Maps came out, I guess Wairapa wasn't high on the focus of the Google Maps. Uh -huh. And we just used to be a blur. You know, there was nothing there. <laughs> and then there was a rumor that the, the winery next door was going up for sale and Google Maps were going to be a purchaser of it. 
holy, we had the clearest map suddenly appear. It was like crystal clear in the thing. So I think a, you know, a little bit of a rumor created uh, quite a nice uh, So visual. Google didn't end up buying it, but it just did, it was a boost for, the, uh, for your Google map. Yeah, okay. we just suddenly appeared with these crystal clear pictures of Google Maps. And who started yeah. that rumor, Patty? I don't know. I mostly yeah, know. I'm Patty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Patty, tell us a bit about the CPR. Why? Why it's yeah. called CPR Paper Road? And, yes. So, I think the reason we did CPR was like a lot of our distribution around the world is with uh, goes into the restaurant trade, mm -hmm. and our distributors in Ireland have some amazing wines that are out of the south of France. And it was so nice to just sit there and enjoy a wine and not try and dissect it, but just go, man, this is just really good to drink. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at it and thought, do we try and do the same? Because we're all about fruit flavors with cool climate viticulture in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. You know, we have great aromatics in the Pinot Gris, good texture, good Chardonnay, good Riesling. And we just didn't want to make another Sauvignon Blanc to go with the Paper Road Pinot Noir. So we thought, well, let's um, have a look at uh, blended varieties together. And also going back up to Alsace, you know, some of the best wines out of Alsace are the blended whites, but they don't sell them. They'll sell them at cellar door because you can't call them the Grand Cru's because they're blended, but they are the best wines. And the winemakers up there will tell you that as well. And they look fantastic. So I still believe that, you know, blending them all together, you actually get a nicer wine. And it's like, I guess Bob Campbell's an interesting one. He goes, if you sit down and try and dissect it for the individual varieties, you never get to enjoy the wine. But everything, but like the Chardonnay, the Pinot Gris and the Riesling, all add a component to make a better blend. So the Riesling for us is, you know, it's got the nice acidity. We get a lot of citrus characters out of it. The Chardonnay, we get a lot of stone fruit. We get the texture. And then the Pinot Gris, it's a bit softer, which is why the Riesling works with it. So we're trying to make a wine that, you can enjoy, drink the whole bottle and enjoy it, but it's got all these flavors and all this beautiful texture and acidity that goes together. So a lot of the CPR, we ferment in big old punchins, old oak, and that gives us a whole lot of uh, selection process to put together. Every year it's different with the ratios of the Pinot Gris, the Chardonnay and the Riesling, because, you know, having a vineyard in the middle of the uh, ocean, every year each variety is going to be different. And yeah. We're not trying to make the same wine every year. It's trying to make the best wine with the material that we get out of our vineyard and putting it together as a blend. So, I heard a story, Patty, that um, when you blend this wine, you um, ask your wife to uh, taste all the different blends because she hates Pinot Gris. So you discover you discover how much Pinot Gris you can put in it without <laughs> her without her just liking the wine. Is that true? Is that, is that it a... is it is true, Stu. We actually. Yes, my wife hates Pinot Gris, hates pears, but loves Riesling. So loves that whole citrus yeah. acidity. So the best part is you take a bottle of uh, Pinot Gris home in a bottle out of the tank or the barrel, and I just leave it in the kitchen. You say nothing, and she walk past, and she goes, that's Pinot Gris, isn't it? Smells it, and then goes, and won't drink it. But if she can smell it, it must be good without having to pour it into a glass. So that's a good indicator for us about the Pinot Gris portion. So... But I think there's a lot of people like that. They, they, they either like the citrus characters or they like Pinot Gris, you know, with the lower acidity. And there's a, either yeah. one, 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 uh, one camp or the other. It's well, really I have a quick question, too, about the Paper Road and specifically this blend. So uh, two questions, actually. One, is this a, when you had originally, I love the story about going to the south of France where there's so much of that experimentation and blending, right? Had you had an actual blend of a Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, and Riesling before, or was this just sort of a top of mind based on what you no. had? No. Um, and then my second question is, during the process of making it, are you, are you co-fermenting it, or are these all separately fermented and blended? Most of them are separately fermented. Some of them we do ferment them all together. Um, we'll do a base portion where we have an idea that we're going to do some Riesling, some Chardonnay, and some Pinot Gris. And we'll do that in one portion, but then it's about topping up and adding a little bit of Pinot Gris or adding a little bit more Riesling, yeah. or adding a bit more of the uh, individuals to sort of tweak it and make it a better wine. So they do co-ferment together, uh, about half of it, okay. and then the rest of it we'll put together and just add what we think's missing. Really hard to try and 
make you blend up before you've started. And that's the, the beautiful of having the options of all these portions and then actually blending it up together. Yeah. It does have a lot of debate with uh, Bryony, who's uh, winemaking here. So we do sit down and it, it's a discussion, not an argument, because you can't just walk in and, uh, <laughs> and say, this is what it's going to be. You know, everyone has a different palette, which we will discuss later. And I think that's the fun of it. You know, everyone sees different things, different acid, different flavors in, in different varietals. But they're all good wines, but then it's putting it together to make that blend. But no, I've never really tried another Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, and Riesling as such. Yeah. I think there's a few people doing more of the Alsatian varieties where they go Pinot Gris, Riesling, and Gewürz. Yeah. And Gewürz is not a big varietal for us in the wider wrapper. It doesn't set and we don't get good yields because of our winds. So extremely, of, extremely windy, guys, in wider wrapper. Extremely windy. So, so the Gewürz um, how, how does the wind uh, complicate the ripening of Gewürz Flowering, flowering. Oh, flowering. Flowering. flowering, okay. I see. So you don't get any crop. Yeah, it can be really good, but then I think, you know, 60, 70% of the time, it's very low yields or no yield at all. So... And there's no point in that. Uh, <laughs> um, why, been... why the name Paper Road too, Patty? Oh. Yes. So Paper Roads, um, we actually have a paper road that runs right through the middle of the vineyard. And if you go back in time, and when they first set up uh, the maps of New Zealand, they just put- Back to my map, paper. guys. <laughs> yeah. So they just put maps on, the, on a flat piece of paper and said, this is where we intend to make the roading for New Zealand to go, and here's a town, and here's something. So they put all these roads on paper about what they wanted to form. Now, originally, Masterton, which is our main town, was going to be on the other side of the river. And we have a paper road that runs through, goes through down there. the main road. And then it goes straight ahead through the vineyard. So that right road through there. Is formed on paper, but legally we own the land, but the council can actually open up and put that road in any time they want. Really? So Pat, Patty, yeah. was that road was that road going to run through there? Right through the middle there, was it? Oh you have you got a yeah. Oh, am I not sure? Am I no, you're sharing? Not it. <laughs> oh, you're not sure. I wonder. Really quick, yeah, and then um, and then I have a question from the from the crowd <laughs> that I'd like to get in. Yeah, sorry, Patty. That there is it, it, does it run by the Ula and run straight through there? It does exactly. Oh, so, yeah. I see. So yeah. that little road here comes straight through here and runs straight, and then they were going to build a bridge over the river. Yes. And then they were going to build the town there. And yeah. they can do that still. Like they could, they could just. Nah, take no, they won't. Patty's okay. too okay. powerful. <laughs> But they can if they wanted they to. So those roads are all through New Zealand. You can walk on the roads, on these paper roads, if you know where they are, and, the, oh. and you go to the council and get the map. Some people are stupid enough to go walking in a paddock with bulls and take their dog and then wonder why they get chased around the paddock. And uh, <laughs> you know, it's... So you got some questions there? Uh, I do, I do, I do. Venkat was going to ask, because we were going back to the co-fermenting, um, and it's a great question. Uh, he was wondering how you decide the right time to pick when you're co-fermenting, given that the grapes ripen at different times. Yeah, that's, that is a tricky one. Sometimes we'll, we'll try and coincide so that if the Pinot Gris, we'll leave some out there and it might get a little bit riper. The Chardonnay, generally for us, our picking season is all for the white, for the reason Chardonnay and the Pinot Gris generally happens within a week. So sure, it's about putting the three together and mm -hmm. saying yes, the Riesling might have a bit more acidity and then the Pinot Gris might be a little bit more riper, but that's about trying to coordinate to pick them all together. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always work and it is tricky, but what we're about in the vineyard is managing our yields year to year so that we do get our fruit ripe in any yeah. given season. So, and it's also about not overcropping your vines so that you're stripping all the nutrients out for the following year. You know, we want good balanced vines that are healthy for every year that we, we pick. Yeah. And, you know, this year is a classic where it was a very early, the earliest season we've ever had. And that would be really? by two weeks. And then last year, you know, that was early. And then two weeks, you know, two years before that was the latest. So we've had a month variation between over four or five years is a month difference from wow. starting picking to starting picking within four years. So whether that's climatic change, I don't know. You know that seems really fast to be like, just blame it on climate change, right? To say like, 
but I haven't. I have the past four years, but yeah, that's super interesting. I have another another discussion about that climate change because if you go, they talk about you know these tw- in farming, there's a 21 year cycle, mm-hmm. and if you go back, like uh, was it last year, and you go back 21 years in the wider wrapper, people were ripening cabernet and getting it fully ripe, and it was a yeah. super hot year. And so you think everyone's forgotten about that. And then you come 21 years and we get another hot year. And is it a 21 year revolving cycle or is it just climate change is about the variability in our, in our climate right. and that we don't have those consistent summers that we used to have, you know, when you're, when you're young, you know, summers were beautiful, they were hot, but now it's quite terrible, but we still have, you know, you go back 21 years, we've still had the, you know, the highest heat summation. And then we've had a cold year in there as well. We've had the lowest heat summation for a year. That's so, fascinating. Yeah. I mean, and obviously this is something you, you have to coordinate with and, and know about to, to plan for these things like ripening and, 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 and harvest and things. Um, so actually, he doesn't have that much, he doesn't this. have that much power to change the weather though. Sorry to say. I get screwed no, right. answer down. <laughs> Um, I, I just want to say, I think uh, for those of you who don't know the CPR, I do encourage you to go get it. I was super excited. I used this in my class um, last fall too, because uh, it's just a great example, I think, of a really ingenious and creative blend. Uh, it's super delicious. It's got great, beautiful acidity. It's so easy to drink and just so bright and, and just beautiful. So thank you. I just want to share that with everyone. I'm sorry we didn't get it all to you, uh, but we'll get those to you later or you can get them on your own, you know? <laughs> Yeah, we should move, move to a wine that they can drink, Patty, and listen to you. So we should talk, do the Savion Blanc. Well, I mean, we can. But yes, yeah, so we can totally do that. That sounds great, too. <laughs> I always thought that when you can't get a wine, it tastes better. It does. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> I'll just get some Savion out of the tank for the 2021 20, vintage. So it'll be Fantastic. Oh my gosh. So yeah, you guys, there we are. He's go- This is happening right now. It's amazing. So... <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's going to get some 2021. Okay. Um, so 2021, honestly, guys, is uh, uh, most of one of New Zealand's best ever vintages throughout the whole of New Zealand. Wow. Our, our only issue is that uh, we're going to run out. It's uh, very low yields. Uh, we most probably uh, a third down on yield. So, um, yeah. So here's 2021. Um, Patty, it looks nice and clean. Yeah. It's sort of uh, still got that. You know, cloudiness and tank. So we, for us, Sauvignon Blanc out of the wire wrapper. Just to go back about Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand, that I guess Marlborough is the engine room for New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, and that's mostly the majority of that comes over to uh, what you see in America is Marlborough. However, wider wrapper is only two percent of New Zealand's grape production. A lot of that is Pinot, and we still make Sauvignon here. So it's not big volumes, but totally different style flavors to Marlborough. And then you would go up north to Hawke's Bay where Rod McDonald um, looks after um, with Tia Wanga. And we, I feel like we are more like Hawke's Bay in terms of Sauvignon with a bit more acid. So we get the same, I guess, riper, a lot more tropical fruits, and we get a lot more of the guava and the lychees, lychees, lychee characters. Yeah. And that's really, you know, that's a t- very characteristic for the wire wrapper. But we go bone dry because we don't have the same acidity as Marlborough. And I think that we get more of the Sancerre characters more than uh, what Marlborough does. So if you compare it to Marlborough, less acidity, but a riper fruit, fruit profile. And that's um, very characteristic. And I think our Sauvignons, when they actually sit in the bottle for 12 months, 18 months, two years, even though the perception is that they want to drink Sauvignon Blanc young and fresh. It does age fantastically out of the wider wrapper and they just it get is, more yeah. intensity. Um, the one that I have right now that we've got over here is the 2019 and it's gorgeous. Um, and that's the one that I have. I mean, it's, 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 it's so fragrant, so aromatic, and it does have a beautiful complexity that I imagine. So, and Patty, the, you're obviously tasting out of the tank. So when, when was that, when was that, uh, so this is- uh, I harvested that, didn't I, Patty? Yeah, you came and helped, Stu. <laughs> one, one day, one day. And I, didn't, and, I didn't, and I didn't get invited to the harvest party. I can't oh. believe it. Yeah, uh, it's pretty tough, Stu. It's pretty tough. <laughs> no, it's, so we, um, Sauvignon this year, I mean, it looks great. You know, it's, uh, there's talk in New Zealand that some of the yields out of Marlborough are down quite a lot. 
and the, there's some seriously good quality come out of it. I think for us in the wider wrapper, our yields, you know, we might run, say, two and a half to three kilos per vine versus mulberry, you might be up to five to six kilos of vine as an average. And I think that's what, why we get this concentration in the Sauvignon out of the wider wrapper. Sure. This year is very early. And for us, it's about not picking on numbers. Every year, the, the bricks will be different, or the sugar, the bomes. And for us, it's about flavor. So when you actually go out into the vineyard, you just eat the berries. And what you taste out there is what you end up in the bottle. It's oh, that's a, amazing. It's a, a really freaky variety for me here, because you go out and taste it, and it'll taste green. It'll taste, and then you get a, a ripe berries, and it just tastes like a fruit salad. Seriously good. Really nice variety to actually go and taste and pick on out of the vineyard. The flavors in the vineyard, and that's what we try and do. We keep it very uncomplicated. It's about the grapes as our base. And then for us in the winery, it's just about taking it in, taking it into the tanks or pressing it, taking it to the tank and keeping it as simple as possible because all the work's done in the vineyard. So it's all about capturing what we've spent the year with trying to achieve in the vineyard and then getting it into a bottle. So we're not doing any oak fermentation. It is pure stainless fermentation, just good clean Sauvignon because the juice is there. Yeah. So I think one of the, the one of the Patty, one of the big things I, I see as a difference, um, Mulder versus Wider Rapper, is um, you, you have a lot of win in, in yes. Wider Rapper. So yield wise, you're always half the yield. When when he says two kilos, guys, that's not even five pounds. Um, so if we just say five pounds for argument's sake, and where where Marlborough would do a minimum of ten pounds. So, yep. you know, it's just twice the yield, so way more concentration, lovely creaminess, and um, always, always a favorite. People, when I used to travel around America, people would uh, tell me that, you know, they've got a bit tired of the Marlboro, blah, 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 and then they try patties and, and, or rods, and especially patties, uh, Borthwick Sauvignon Blanc, and, the, and it blows them away how the concentration, the creaminess, and... Um, just the length of palate, it's really, it's a, it's a great wine. Yeah, for those of you who have it, I mean, are you kind of getting that creaminess is really coming through. I think the texture of this wine is really beautiful. Do you do lees aging with it? Oh, it's, oh. it sits in the tank for maybe three, four months on light okay. lees. So it does sit on its lees, but I, th I think what we get out of our vineyard is a sweetness. You know, it's mm. like a fruit sweetness. And the way I look at it is you go to a supermarket and you buy a nectarine. Okay, and you can buy one that's been picked early and stored. And when it goes to the supermarket, it tastes of a nectarine. But if you get one off a tree that's ready and ripe and you can get it before the birds get it, it tastes sweet. And I think that's what we get with the Sauvignon Blanc. Is, and I think it's through the other wines as well. It's this fruit sweetness, not the sugar sweetness, fruit sweetness. And I think for the Sauvignon out of the Wairapa, once it's had you know, 12 to 18 months in the bottle, that sweetness comes back, even though it's bone dry. And some people go, your wine's too sweet. And you're going, it's got no sugar in it at all. It's just yeah. good, ripe fruit, sweetness. Yeah. And I think that's a key for the Sauvignon. And I think that's the same with Hawke's Bay, you know, with, um, with the wines up there, that they have the, that same beautiful sweetness that comes through. And I think it's, that's what makes the wines quite unctuous. What will happen with the, the alcohol this year of the 21? Is it... If, you know, you don't really want to, um, what was the alcohol last year, 14%. You're yeah. a bit higher than, than normal. So you yeah, had two hot seasons. Yep, yeah. 14's on the high side for us. But this year we're about 13.4 13, 13 okay. in, the, in the tank, which I think is great. You know, nice balance, good acidity, and same thing, these you know lovely flavours sitting in the tank. So it's it's pretty exciting. It's It's nice to... You know, spend that whole year of growing your grapes and then go and harvest them and then see them in the tank and go, it's not another season down, but it's, um, you know, we've got through the whole climatic variances and I guess, you know, climatic influences that yeah. challenge us here having one vineyard. So, but it's good. I think everyone's. How often excited. do you, how often do you taste those wines in the, in the tank and the barrel, Patty? Oh, we'd go like now that they're mostly all tucked away. Every couple of weeks, we'll go through and taste them. And it's more just checking them because they do change and, and it's just keeping an eye on them. And it's, I think it's just good for your own 
memory. You're, you're looking at the wines and you're just forming your own, you know, perception if you taste them more regularly instead of just putting them in the barrel and go, oh, we'll, we'll you know, have a look in three or four months' time. I think it just keeps you on top of your wines. Mm -hmm. It keeps you fresh with what's happening with them. So most of them will go through and taste every couple of weeks. I have a, I have a question about, so you have about, a, what, maybe like 12 tanks behind you or so? I don't know, yep. roughly? Yes. Um, yep. Ish, ish. But there's, out of all of those tanks, um, if all of them have Sauvignon Blanc in them, do you taste through and do they taste, do each of the tanks taste different? And then do you blend between the tanks? I'm just sort of curious, like how different are they or not at all? Well, they are very different. We have uh, two blocks of Sauvignon here and they are both very different. And so okay. we have one a little bit earlier and then one when it's uh, a bit later and that's the rootstock they're on. I think that's um, created a variance. It's the same, like, uh, like New Zealand, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc all came in on this, what they call the mass selection. Someone brought some cuttings in and I think that's how, I think Ross Spence might've brought it in from Matua. And that's pretty much how the whole Sauvignon Blanc started. And then someone decided that would buy some, uh, get some more Ontave clones out of France for the new variances of uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. And sure, they added different characteristics, a lot more passion fruit, a lot more of other characters, but everyone's gone back to this one mass selection. So it seems like it, this one stick of Sauvignon that came into New Zealand has ended up everywhere. And it seems to be the better clonal choice for most vineyards. The rootstocks were on a different, We've got one which is on a rootstock called Riparia, and that's mm -hmm. a, it's a devigoring rootstock, and the roots go straight down, versus the other ones on Schwarzman, and their roots go like this. So the Riparia one, he's devigorating for the vines, but we still get a, the same yield out of it. It just has a better flavor. Because so it, it has to work harder because it's the, the rootstock is making the vine itself work harder. Yeah. It does, and the roots on the riparia, because they go straight down, now we don't, we don't have to irrigate at all for it. Versus, you know, the, the Schwarzman one, it's more of a shallow rooter. It okay. doesn't go straight down. So, yeah, it's do just- Do you tend every, to irrigate a lot? Or do you need to? Uh, we, we, only, we irrigate for the younger vines, you know, up yeah. to about 10 years old, and they just need it when it gets into the peak of summer that mm -hmm. we do have to top up. And it's more for the health of the vines. But the older vines that have those deeper roots, very seldom do we have to irrigate them now, which is great. It's yeah. really good. So Yeah. Yeah. I have another question. Sorry. From the group, from Venkat, yeah. um, asking about <laughs> the tanks behind you, since we have this great visual, right? Yeah. So um, he's wondering if the tanks behind you are the aging tanks or the fermentation tanks. And no. uh, what's the clamp-like device on the top of the tank to your right? You want to take the, you want to take the... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the computer take, over there. I can take you for a tour. So yes. this is this is actually all the these are all the Pinot tanks. Okay, okay. so they're all, they're all open top fermenters, and this this uh, gadget up the top is our plunger. So it's a pneumatic plunger, and it's got two big paddles. I might be might be still there. I might be able to see it through. Walk up the top. Oh, well, yeah. you're going to show us under. Yeah. Ooh. So it's on a big, uh, like a pneumatic ram, and it pushes pushes down. And as it comes up on the plates, they twist, and so it comes up through the cap and then turns and goes down again. So it's a very gentle uh, plunger, and and it's 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 good because it just moves from one tank to the next, mm -hmm. and then we can you know do all the ferments. So that's the uh, so that all the red fermenters for Pinot. But they also double because they have, we have these uh, things called floating lids, which is, you can see, sitting on the tops of the tanks there. They're there called we, what? Floating? Floating lids. lids. They, when we, uh, for the Sauvignon that's in the tanks, so they just float on top of the wine. Oh. And then they have a um, seal. You can see the, the black seal on it. And yeah. that, yeah, um, we just put air in it and it seals and locks the lid, uh, the tank up so there's no air in the tank. So they're called uh, variable capacity tanks. So we ferment the pinots in the open tops and then we use these lids to store the wine in afterwards. So there's no... So that, any third one, that third one along, Paddy, has got Sauvignon Blanc in or fourth one along? Yes. yes so all the know. rest have been used for open ferments for your pinot, yep. where that fourth one there, where you just took that from, that's yep. got the floating lid on top, 
and it's yep. full of juice. And that floating lid depends how how much liquid's in that tank. Sure. So they sit. So you can see here. Cool. So it's the lid on top, and it just yep. floats on top of the wine. And then once it's um, you've finished with your tank, you just blow the seal up through this little thing here, and it seals it. And then you just, so you don't have to transport the wine. It's like it ferments and then ages in the same. No, that's, they're more for storage in those tanks. Okay. So this is the, oh, I haven't got the lights on, but you can see here, they're mainly the ferment, white fermentation tanks mm -hmm. there. And then they, it's more about having your wine when they're finished ferment, so we have no air in the top of them. And they, it's the, what they call it in a wine, it's called the ullage. Mm -hmm. And so by taking, removing that ullage, you have no oxygen in your wine. So it's, uh, it works pretty well. Do you want to move through to the Pinot block, uh, the, uh, uh, the barrel room now, Patty? Okay. <laughs> Stu's, on a, Stu's a taskmaster. Master. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just noticed the time. Oh, it's good. Yes, yes, we are We are moving along. We have more rooms to see everyone. It's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. More parts of the winery. I think so we've we lost Patty. He's here. fallen down a drain. Did we lose Patty? Hello, Patty. I, I think he fell down a drain. <laughs> so, I mean, this is so, but Stu, this is fun because this is kind of what we were talking about doing was this idea of being able yep. to bring everyone to New Zealand. And kind of since we can't actually physically be there, <laughs> idea that we can all watch That's this. That's right. <laughs> so we're traveling with Patty too. Yeah. Gosh. That? So that was a that was a big walk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was quite a big night last night, Stu. The, uh, so this is um this is in the, the barrel room, which is next door to the uh, the Pinot tanks. And so all these barrels here we store Pinot in. Um, some of the Chardonnay and the Pinot Gris goes into the bigger punchins on the that side yeah <laughs> the left side the left side yeah. and then all the pinot barrels mainly stay in here so we normally have uh still got some empty barrels to fill up and all these are sort of designed so that we can put in you know approximately 10 to 12 barrels as one fermenter of pinot and then okay. we can keep each pinot fermenter separate uh, separate and 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 see you know as it progresses over the year and um, they all get a bit of new oak and then we go through in sort of November and start working out what we want to put into the paper road pinot mm -hmm. and what goes into the Borthwick pinot ah. and again, the briny, you know different palettes so we have uh, good discussions Stu sometimes so, comes down and puts his uh, puts his palette or, with it puts my ore in Tell us a little bit about Bryony, uh, Patty. She's pretty important to, to you because she's 100% different. She's way better looking and, and she's a bit, a bit softer and a bit more technical, well, a bit more lab focused or numbers focused. Yeah, look, Bryony's, um, she's done quite a few vintages throughout New Zealand and overseas and uh, was working next door. And we had Braden, who used to be with me for about 10 years, and then he went off down to Martinborough and brought a vineyard. And then we had another guy, Thomas, and he came for a year, and then he went and brought a vineyard. I thought, oh, man, it's like saying to Braden, did you not learn anything in 10 years? You're working here. What did you buy a vineyard for? <laughs> and then had uh, another guy, Alex. He came for a year as, uh, to work for vintage, and then he brought a vineyard. So I looked at it and we're going like, next ad I'm putting in, it's like, that's the first question. Do you intend to buy a vineyard, you know? So anyway, Bryony's, um, Bryony's good. She's got a good palate, good, really good technical, good in the lab and a good winemaker. So it's really good to work with Bryony. Different palates, but we're, it's complementary for us, for both of us to work together. And um, Bryony sort of basically runs the, runs the winery when I'm not here and looks after all the day-to-day -day and the staff in the vineyard. And I think the best, nicest part about it with Bryony is, you know, she's been working at wineries all the time. And the, the discussion was that you've got to understand the vineyard to make the wine. And so she's really enjoyed that of learning about the vines and the varieties and the grapes and the areas in the vineyard and how to best get those parcels to make great wine out of the vineyard. So she's really enjoyed the whole viticultural uh, aspect of it. And 
she loves it. You know, it's really good to see Bryony's been here and this is coming up three, 17, 18, 19, 20, four years. Mm -hmm. And really good to see Bryony suddenly looking at parts of the vineyard and going, well, I remember that from last year or the last two years. This is what we can do to tweak it to get something better out of it in any given year. So that's, you know, that's, um, I think that's the key. You know, a lot of people, I guess the winemakers want to take the, the, you know, the credibility for the great wines, but I think it's all about the viticulture. That's yeah. right, isn't it, Stu? You'd back me up on that one. <laughs> yeah, been a viticulturalist. Yeah, been a viticulturalist. Um, it's always amazing. Everyone turns to the winemaker and gives them the award. Um, but I think most, most winemakers are not uh, that silly that uh, they underestimate the viticulturalist. Most viticulturalists are tougher than the great uh, winemakers, so we beat them up. <laughs> so, but it's interesting. So you talk about the, the vineyards and the wine, and so Brian, you 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 work with Brian to sort of choose the blends and choose what goes to Paper Road and what goes to Borthwick, right? Totally. And totally. and that is something that is is obviously you taste that, but you have an idea of the vineyard of the fruit in the vineyard. What's going to go into each of the wines to begin with, or no? Totally. I think a lot of the, interestingly with Pinot, because you're watching it grow through the season and then you get close to picking and you almost, you almost pick and blend your wines before you've picked it. It ah. seems weird, but you know, we've got um, quite a few different uh, sections in the vineyard that we harvest separately and you, not one year is saying that this is going to be great every year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with the different clones, we get different climates and some clones look better some years than others. And then other years, you know, you swear it's going to look really good and you put it into the tank and we taste them every day during the uh, fermentation with the, when the Pinots are in the tank and you almost form your own judgment then about what's going to be better. And so we decide then that these tanks, we will allocate more new oak to it to give it an opportunity to get into the Borthwick label versus the paper road. But then gets into the barrel, goes through its malo, and sometimes still surprises you that you, what you think or you thought was going to be really good in barrel over time doesn't look as good. And I think that's Pinot, you know, we just never get on top of it. You can predict it and have a, you know, a, an assumption of what you think is going to be good, but it's not till you actually start blending it you know, six, seven months later and looking at the wines that you really get your true decision about what's better and what's not. Yeah. So, hey, hey pa Paddy, um, later on we'll talk about um, the left and right hand, but with the Borthwick and the um, Paper Road, Pinots, you have around about 50 barrels there, is that? Yeah, Borthwick, the Borthwick wine, we generally do 50 barrels. And I think that's just picking the best 50 barrels and and it's, it's just saying, we're gonna make you know 1100 cases and that's it for the Pinot. It's always tempting to make more, but I think by sitting at 1100, you're picking your best 50 barrels and it's always tempting to go, oh, that's good as well. And that's good as well. And that's good. But you just got to cut it and say, these are the best 50 barrels out of our vineyard in any given season. And that's what we put into the Paddy Borthwick. And so it, what, and it, what are people what are people seeing here? And because uh, most of most people I meet have really, not many have tried Central Otago, hardly any have tried uh, White Arapa, um, yep. and yep. they've mainly only had uh, Malden because they bought Savion Blanc, and so they buy a Malden Pinot. So, you know, not a lot of Americans have tried New Zealand Pinots. Um, they have their own, you know, Russian River, and, 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 and you know, Calif right throughout California, and of course, French. So what, what, are, what are these guys here seeing different in this wine? What, tell us a bit about the flavour spectrum. And, so this is the 2019, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Correct. So 2019, I think it's a big wine for a start. Mm -hmm. It's mostly, it's a lot, what I would call, it's uh, a lot more grunty as a Pinot from the Wairapa than what we would typically produce out of the Wairapa. I think Wairapa typically gets a lot of those savory, earthy, uh, you know, forest floor characters over time. We get a lot more of the primary red fruits to start with. And then as it um, ages, we get a lot more of the savory characters coming through. I think the other key part about Warrapa Pinot is we get this juicy, juice, juicy, fleshy <laughs> mid palate. And that's the key is this whole fruit sweetness again, very similar to the Sauvignon Blanc. 
And there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's, it's about trying to find that balance of those good tannins by using whole bunch for the stalks versus mm -hmm. having something that's too tannic versus what we want is to create the elegance in the Pinot. So 2019 is a big Pinot for the Wairapa. They were, it was a small yield and uh, it, it, the wines are they're big Pinots. Yeah. So, it's got great, like juicy. It, it's very juicy, but um, the savory notes, even for the 2019, I think are coming through beautifully right now already. It does have that earthiness. It does have that kind of forest floor pretty prominently and, and really lovely um, on that, uh, which is fun and exciting. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, it, it is, a bit, look, I think 2019, a lot of people rate it as a fantastic vintage, but I think we say that every year because every year is different and every year is still a little bit better than the last one because it's uh, you get more excited <laughs> about it. <laughs> and the last one still in the bot bottle, but I love the way the Warwick Pinots, when they age, you know, they, they, we have this amazing, uh, great acidity in our wines in the Pinots. Mm -hmm. And um, as they age, that acidity keeps the wine together. And then you get this whole complexity of development without trying to put too much oak into it. You know, we still yeah. want to chase that fruit, but it is about this whole complete palate of getting through the middle of the palate, around the sides of the palate, and through the roof of your mouth. I think that's um, what we aim to do with the, the Borthwick Pinot. And it's, you know, every year is different and every clone is different. So, so, so Patty, when you when you do your blending, it's November-ish, um, yeah. so that you and Brian, you, you, you basically taste through all your barrels and, and tank and create yeah. the blend. Yes. Um, so, you know, at that time, how, how's, how do you work through that? I mean, that's a lot of wines to taste and register in your opinion. So how we, how we do it, Stu, is because they're all in batches, we'll start with the batch, okay? And we'll have, you know, so simulating a tank, we'll leave the new oak out of it because you're looking for the, the base wine without the new oak influence in it. And then we can go through and we'll line up the, you know, 14, 15 batches that we've put into barrel and go through and first of all evaluate those and then decide what we like as the wines as a batch out of the tank and it's it's you taste them anyway but you when you do it blind and you line them up in a, in a proper lineup they do change and we do it over a couple of days we try and do it on the fruit days we're not biodynamic we're not organic but we're about practice and i'd still believe that you know tasting wines on the fruit days the wines do look better and we've been down that where you've you know tasted them on a on a on a root day and they look really flat and dull, but you get on a fruit day and they shine. And you just see more things in those wines on the fruit days than you will on a root day. Ah, today is a root day over here. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just can't. <laughs> We're in root, everybody, but it still tastes yeah, beautiful. <laughs> you're rooted. Hey, um, Patty, so <laughs> so um so, because your paper road, you try and make a, a style that's fresh, more fruit driven, not really a lot of oak dominance, where the, 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 the Borthwick Pinot, you want to age and you want some real structure to it. So, yeah. that must be what you're seeing when you do your blending as well, yeah? Oh, you're totally, Stu. And I guess we look at paper road Pinot is more about purity of fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, purity and, and just about this whole, you know, it, it shows forth the whole primary characters of the fruit out of the vineyard. And uh, some of it, some of that paper road doesn't necessarily even go to barrel. You know, we'll keep it in the tank and mm -hmm. it just sits there on its um, light leaves. And that's, um, that's part of it. But it's, uh, it's all about purity of fruit, good Pinot in the bottle. And I think that's what we want out of the paper road versus the the Paddy Borthwick's more about the ageability, the complexibilities of the Pinot. And that's why we pick those 50 barrels because it shows that, you know, it's got more oak, we've got more structure, more tannin, bigger wines, and they go together in a blend. And that will make what we call, you know, it's, it's just a, a much bigger version of the Paper Road. So the Paper Road will be a little bit more fruity tooty kind of thing okay. without being, yeah, without being, which is most certainly more Californian because they, California tends to be warmer climate, so it tends to be have that more fruit driven yeah. style. Yeah. Well, it, be, sorry. 
No, 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 it's okay. I, I apologize. I was jumping in just because there's a couple comments here of people saying they love the wines. I just want to let you know that. But Nancy yeah. has actually made a comment also saying that New Zealand Pinot Noir, it tends to be less astringent than Burgundy, but less fruity than California, which is exactly what you're saying now. Uh, mm -hmm. And she did say that this is a beautiful example of New Zealand Pinot Noir. So oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, look, it's, it'd be nice to make all of our vineyard as Pinot into the Paddy Borthwick, but Pinot just doesn't do that for you. It's just, it's like a whole lot of young kids, you know, and it just, they, they don't behave like they should sometimes. So it's, um, and that's why we have the two labels, I think, because it would be nice to make all of it into Paddy Borthwick. But I think by just doing the 50 barrels, we make a much better wine and, um, you know, taking those 50 and then, I mean, all the wines are good, but some years just some are better than others and different. Hey, different, hey, you know, hey Patty, yeah. do you want to take everyone up to the break where you, you and you and Bryony sit most of the day having coffee, <laughs> and uh, just tell them tell everyone about uh, uh, the left and right hand. Uh, right. So the nice part about this winery is you get very fit because we've got a lot of stairs and uh, it's like the CrossFit room, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, so that sort of looks like the barrels from up top, but it's um so <clears throat> we may lose them when he goes out for a little bit. We'll we'll see. Well then we still have used to, so yeah, that's 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 a, it's the worrying thing. Yeah. <laughs> you, never, you never get rid of Stu. <laughs> <laughs> We would never want to get rid of Stu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's the view from up at the top. Okay. So this is uh let's see here. Um yes. It's beautiful there, man. Yeah. It's pretty great. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Not a bad office. It's pretty <laughs> no. good office. Not a bad office. <laughs> no. So, so yeah. guys, guys, right behind Patty, directly behind him. Um, on the, on our left side, that is where his farm is. Uh, Three thousand acre farm, sheep and beef. So um, that's where he lives. Yep. So so what we've got here is so these are the other two pinots that we do, mm -hmm. and these are the is it focused or not? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So this is the, the top end pinots that we do called the left hand and the right hand pinots. So these are more about, so the paper road's about the purity of pinot, the borthwick's about the complex, complexibilities of pinot, and these two are about the personalities of pinot. And the reason we do the personalities is, is when I had, um, I guess it's about, you know, everyone has a different taste of pinot and what they like, and so when Bryony and I are sitting down, Bryony likes a certain style of Pinot. I like a certain style of Pinot. So you've got all these barrels to choose from, and it's about who's right and who's wrong on what makes the best Pinot. So you can't turn up and just go, right, this is what we're going to make as the top Pinot. So we decided that, you know, I said to Bryony, you go and pick your best three barrels. I'll go and pick my best three barrels. We'll bottle them separately and then go head to head against them. So one of us is left-handed and one of us is right-handed. So we look at it like, it's not trying to say one's better than another. It's just that if you had two chefs, same table of ingredients and ask those two chefs to cook the same dish, they'll be different. Okay, so each chef thinks that he might like more salt, he might like more, you know, more acidity. But then it comes down to the individuals on what they like as the dish. So this is the same with Pinot. So the two different Pinots, but they're both good Pinots and the, the ultimate is to put them on a table together and then put a sock on them if you want. And then you pour them out and it's about making people actually look at two Pinots and go, which one do they like without having the price point as a interference, the brand as an interference or the region as an, an interference or the country. This is about making people go, do you like the wine? Which one do you enjoy? And you put and you put different foods with them, they'll change the wines as well. So it's about having some fun. I guess we call it it's like taking the bullshit out of expensive Pinot 
and actually deciding what you like without the influences of everything else around you. And people look and go, oh, it's $100. It should be good. I must like it. But they might like a $10 Pinot. That's fine. It comes down to if you like it, drink it. If you don't like it, don't drink it. So it's about just having some fun and going, you know, Bryony's got a different style. She likes more of the, a bit more oak, a bit more acidity. She's more of this, uh, more fruit in the, in, the, uh, in the nose. And I think I chase more of the structure. So it's really interesting to look at the two wines. And when we send them off to wine writers, some wine writers will like one and some wine writers will like another. Mm -hmm. So the wines, when we do the, uh, we do a lot of the, at the food, food and wine shows in Australia, and it's fantastic because it's not one wine is always liked. They're 50-50 amongst the, the, the audience. But it's great when you get a couple come up and you give one the right hand, one the left hand, and they'll look at each other and then work out which one they like. What do they actually like without an influence of, uh, you know, things that create people's mind to say, I should like this versus... I'm actually tasting it to see if I do like it and what I like in a Pinot. So it's That's been, awesome. it's been, yeah, it's been, it's been really good. And it's also a good leveler for, you know, for Bryony and myself to go, you know, are we do it, making the best wines from the choices and options we have available? Mm -hmm. It's almost like a double check on ourselves as well um, sure. to look at those wines as they age. You know, some will go to a wine show and one will win a gold medal, the other one will win nothing. Go to another wine show, it flip flops. So it's, it's fantastic to see that, you know, two good Pinots from one vineyard comes down to the personalities that make those wines and they work for some people and don't work for others. Yeah. So that, that's the fun of the, the left and the right. Hey, Sasha, it, it could be a good idea later on in the year, we, um, if the team wanted to, we could do a tasting uh, with the left and right hand. We actually have... Um, I mean, this, this wine, you know, only makes uh, 100 six packs or something like that. So there's not a lot of uh, this wine around, but we actually have a couple of 2016s, a couple of six packs in America, and we could put another uh, uh, vintage on the, uh, one of the boats, a 2018 or 2019, a couple of six packs, and um, maybe later in the year, doing left and right hand uh, tasting. I mean, I think that sounds like an amazing idea. I, I hope that everyone on this call would agree with me on that. Was anyone on this call, just give a shout out if you're willing to do comparisons of the left hand and the right hand with Patty, the winemaker. Uh, <laughs> I think it would probably be really fun. <laughs> yes, we're getting a lot of feedback. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm super excited about that too, because Patty, it's probably really, like you're saying, the way to not just know each vintage to taste them side by side, but then to taste as they age and the vintages as they kind of change, right? Uh, mm -hmm. How the stylistically, the personalities kind of remain consistent or diverge too over the years. Oh, it is. It's, it, no, it's really good. I mean, Stu was down, when was that? Oh, is that during vintage? We did the, yeah, 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 yeah. Two months ago, month yeah. and a half ago. So we did a, the vertical back to uh, where we first started. 2011. Mm. It was really good. They, you know, they look really great and you can see the vintage variability from one year to the next but the wines still look great and they've still got that beautiful acidity and just softening and getting that whole savory gamey complexities in them and uh yeah, there's still you know the difference between the left and the right and and there is a difference it's quite quite yeah. out, it's 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 blows you away you know same vineyard same winemakers and and everything's the same but they've just chosen three different barrels and uh and, and the difference is quite extreme. I mean, that's, I, I did, I have a chance to taste, um, I think it was the 2018s earlier this year when we were going through the tastings for this, but, and they were so, it was an incredible thing just to taste those two next to each other that had that, you know, it, it very distinct personalities, completely different yep. profiles, but really both super beautiful, um, cool. which is great. Uh, and so I think, I think it's a go guys, if you're up for it, Sometime this fall, we'll do the side-by-side -side comparison. We'll get those out there and we'll have you back, which will be amazing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know where you're gonna take us next because this has been such a beautiful- uh, <laughs> We should do it on the, we'll do it on the farm, but the, he doesn't have much internet up there. Right there. <laughs> you can do it in the shearer's shed. <laughs> yeah, do it in the shearer's shed. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Please. I do have a question here. I have one more question. It's kind of uh, off topic at the moment, but I'm going to throw it if you don't mind. Are you okay, guys, staying on for just a couple more minutes just for sure, sure. final questions? Are you guys good? Awesome. Because I know we're at six. Thank you guys so much. If anyone needs to go, I totally understand. It's been so wonderful to have you. Uh, but Ben had a question actually going back to Riesling um, and uh, your, uh, your philosophy on TDN in Riesling. And if you, it's something you try to avoid or are there particular strategies you use to avoid TDN and Riesling? Thoughts avoid, on that? To avoid, what, what was that? The, uh, the TDN, TDN, the compound, the petrol, the petrol aromas, the compound. Petroleum, yeah. 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 Uh, I, it, I find Riesling an interesting one when you're tasting with people. Some people just pick and say Riesling and automatically think it has that petroleum character. I think we don't get so much of the petroleum character in the Riesling. I don't know why. I'm not sure whether it's a clonal selection or whether it's soils. We do a lot of uh, we we do a lot of leaf removal in our vineyard around the fruit, and we use the sheep. So we bring them off the farm, and they sit there over the December. And it's just you know peak summer for us, and the the fruits, uh, the the bunches have just flowered, and then they set, and the little berries are really hard and the and the bitter. So the sheep won't eat the fruit, but they'll take the leaves off. So we completely remove the leaves. Riesling seems to be a variety, whether it's got it's got a, a like a fairy prickle on the base of it, on the underside, and the sheep don't eat it. So we've gone to leaving more leaf on the Riesling. And I think before, when we were taking that leaf off, we were losing too much acidity out of the vineyard from the, the wine, from the grapes. But I think... It's Riesling's one of those varieties that for us tasting it in the vineyard, it's like the Sauvignon. You just go and taste it. And sometimes we've had 10% alcohol in Riesling. And then other, other years we've had 13 and a half, 14%. Wow. And it's all about just picking it on the flavor. I don't see us getting so much of that petroleum. We get more of the, you know, a lot more of those citrus lime characters and a lot more of the blossom characters as primary. And then as it ages, I think we get more of this toasty brioche character huh. and it's sort of it feel, you look at it and sometimes think it's almost got oak in it but it's like a toasted brioche character with the acidity and still has those flavors but that's that's just i don't know why or how uh, yeah I, I i read quite a lot about it um, a few years ago and and they all said that new zealand did have quite a lot of uh, that petroleum uh, um, yeah, palette on, on, on New Zealand Riesling and they put it down to um, the damage uh, between during harvest with the machine pickers and 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 how how the juice and the skin make contact. Um, but a lot of people because if you harvest the Riesling um, un, you know unripe, those flavors, those petroleum flavors tend to come out a lot more. Where if you harvest them um, very ripe, there's not as much damage to the to the skins and the juice. Um, plus, our harvesters are way better now. They're, they're very sophisticated, mm -hmm. and 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 with that, you don't tend to get that. And it's more the what a lot of people call it here is more of that apricot, um, so really ripe apricot flavors rather than petroleum. Um, and and so there is a difference, a slight difference. And I think it has a lot to do with getting riper Riesling because years ago um, when we used to everyone used to harvest Riesling it was always one of the most unripe grapes in the vineyard um, so I used to manage 70 growers and quite a few thousand hectares or acres 10,000 acres of different vineyards throughout Hawke's Bay and and really the the Riesling is the, the poor cousin and everyone and and during what Patty says when you're tasting the fruit you know, you used to love tasting Sauvignon Blanc, but Riesling is not very nice to taste at all. It, 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 when you bite into it, 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 it comes into your mouth like an oyster. It doesn't taste like an oyster, but it has comes as one big lump rather than it explodes. And and so you tend to not, um, you you tended to not really harvest it that right. And we tended to get a lot of that uh, petroleum in the first year after bottling. Well, I think now in New Zealand. Uh, we're, we're looking after the yield. We're, we're getting them riper, especially patties, and and that whole skin to juice contact is not as severe. Yeah, well, totally, totally. These my five minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great. 
Um, does anyone have any other burning questions before we let these two gentlemen get on with it? It's, it's actually only one o'clock on Saturday there, right? Correct. That's right. I've, not, <laughs> I've mowed the lawn, so I don't care. <laughs> um, but does anyone have any other questions or does anyone want to say anything? Un unmute and say thank you and hello and anything you'd like to Patty hey, and Steve here. So guys, if you want to have a look at more, you can look at uh, my website, divinewine.co.nz. Yes. And there's some videos on there on social media of Patty, of uh, video Bryony and interviewed Bryony and Patty and tasted wines. And so if you want to look at it, they're only one minute long. Uh, I'll videos. send them all to you guys. Yeah, it's just on a website, just a pretty yeah. simple. Um, I You can hear me more than them because it's only on a cell phone. So, uh, <laughs> But it's good to see anyway. Yeah, and so I'll include that um, in the email that I send everyone out as the thank cool. you for coming. I'll give the link to Stu's website and to the to the videos as well. Uh, also, yeah, thank you guys so much. This has been really, really amazing. Um, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to being able to do this again with you in the fall. This will be fantastic. Cool, wicked. We have to organize yeah. it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it. It's getting organized as we speak. So Just that's to, good. <laughs> you'll, be to, you'll be able to fly out here then and do it from here. <laughs> uh, you know, that's a really great idea, Patty. I think I think I should. I think I should definitely do that. <laughs> but what is it? I'm going to have to quarantine for two weeks still. <laughs> uh, you're not even, yeah, even then you're still not allowed to come up. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, Someday. But, but one day, maybe next year. <laughs> maybe next year would be great. We're allowing, we're allowing those bloody Aussies in, so it's gotta be, uh, we've got to have an American coming in soon. Yeah, I can just I can just try. I, I'll work on my Aussie accent and see if I can fool them. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, you guys are wonderful. Thank everyone. Thank you to everyone who came and to joined us today. This was a really really fun. You guys are like my favorites. Don't tell the other winemakers. <laughs> Nobody enough. else tell them either. But you guys are yeah. the best. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for the time. Thank you everyone for you know coming along and clipping in. Awesome. Very good. Yeah, you're awesome, Patty. That was great. Yeah. Great. Well, cheers then, everyone. I'm going to do a toast. I'll say cheers to you. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. I think it's still okay to say that, even though it's Saturday there and uh, you're a day ahead of us. But uh, <laughs> I wish you both a fantastic weekend. And I wish you all here in the United States a wonderful weekend as well. So I'll sign everyone off. Salud. Yeah. Be Salud. safe. See you guys. Have a good weekend. Thanks. <laughs>